So I, I rang the bell just for, for formality because you're all already in here. So uh, it's, it's a well-trained group. You know, know it here, and you're all excited to see Ken Caldera. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce him today. One of the uh, pleasures of, of being a director in this uh, institution is that, um, is that you actually get to see what's going on in the other departments. Carnegie is really an amazing place, and seeing the, the six departments and the uh, diversity of work that goes on there uh, is really a fascinating aspect of being director. So I've seen a lot of Ken's work at, at various board meetings and the like, and also in the news releases that come out of the institution. He works on a, a wide range of subjects uh, dealing with uh, greenhouse gases, uh, their impact, things like ocean acidification. Uh, he's got a very exciting project going on net zero energy uh, uh, production. Uh, he, I also saw in his uh, CV that he worked on impacts and extinctions, which is something close to our heart on, the, on this campus. So Ken got his degrees in, in New York, at New York University, in atmospheric sciences, spent some time at, uh, uh, actually an NSF fellow uh, at uh, Penn State. Uh, so these, are, these NSF fellowships are very prestigious. Moved on from there to uh, postdoc at Lawrence Livermore Laboratories and then joined Carnegie in 2005. Right. So uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Ken Caldera speaking on climate, oceans, and energy. I, I'm impressed that you remembered all that without notes and everything. That was pretty good. I don't know how you do it. Ken, you're good with the lapel. Okay, I'm good with the lapel. So, um, yeah, so it's good to be here. So I've been working at Carnegie since 2005, and I've never been to the Pasadena offices. I've never been to these offices here. And so it just seemed like it was a good time to make amends for that. Uh, and um, I guess the, and so the talk I'm going to give is really not going to be a normal scientific talk. I thought I would give like an overview of the kind of work that's been going on in my group. So this was more like introducing my group to you all rather than a normal scientific talk. Um, so let's, and also, I think I have too many slides, so some of them I'm going to end up just running through quickly. Um, yeah, so first of all, what is this is like the current um, membership of my group. And so I, my group is a postdoc run, but not run, it is postdoc run, but it's a postdoc driven organization. So Elizabeth is a part, on the bottom there is a part time uh, administrative assistant that helps me run this thing, but everybody else there is postdoc. So I don't have any students right now. And, um, and the funding. You know, there's some endowment funding, but most of the funding, there's a little bit of NSF funding, but most of the funding comes basically from a, a gift from Bill Gates, which is good. And so just, just to give, and so I have an organization where I'm very opportunistic. I don't worry about disciplinary boundaries or anything. I just try to think what's, what's the highest return on investment activity that I can engage in now? Like what's the most interesting thing that will have the most impact? that I can think of to do. And th so I'm completely broad, you know, general studies in my approach. But the individual postdocs are more, um, more focused. So just to say what, just run quickly through what each one is doing, which is probably give you the best idea of what my group is. So um, let me see if I can find the, oh yeah, so Tyler, he actually came from CERN and as a background in high energy particle physics, but he's been doing uh, energy system modeling with me in an optimization context. Enrico, for his PhD, did um, siting of wind turbines in a wind farm of you know avoiding the wakes and so on. And right now he's looking at the controls on um, kinetic and, and momentum transport in the free troposphere overlying uh, drag on the surface. Uh, Ninka is a little bit, this I was going to say, it's a little um, uh, outlier for the group. And she's been working on, right now looking at plastics and mussels, which is a different you know, marine thing. So um, Ishwan is working on issues related to aerosol releases and health and climate. Rebecca is, um, she has a water sort of resource background, but has been um, getting into the energy system modeling stuff. David, and same thing is true of David Farnham. Manu is, um, she's basically been doing work on coral reefs and right now is in Brazil in an expedition that I'll talk about in a little bit. Gita is working on climate effects of aerosols. 
Lay is basically general various climate things. David is um, sort of ocean engineering type things. Candace has a watery, climatey background, but is doing energy system stuff. And so kind of a mix of, yeah, so anyway, that's that. So yeah, so the group strategy is, I just try to hire great people. Yeah, so the other good thing is neither the endowment funding nor the uh, Gates funding has specific deliverables associated with it. So I can just really try to find real, the, it's not, like the Gates funding's not open in that if Gates isn't interested in what we're doing, we're not gonna get continued funding. But it's, we have the flexibility to apply it as we want in any given year and then sort of tell him what we did. And then if he's, so, so basically I try to find really great people who are interested in topics aligned with the group interests and Gates interests. And then I try to facilitate their success, very simple. And then, you know, the fundamental group principles, um, you know, that, uh, you know, I really believe on, on that, you know, basically I see myself mostly as a facilitator of the success of the postdocs. And, um, you know, that if they're successful, then I'm successful. And I also think that people do best when they're doing what they want to do. And so, you know, I want to just be in the state of encouraging people and if I'm having to sort of try to discourage them from doing something, then, you know, something's not working out. Uh, yeah, the other thing is this, that I, I never ask that my people to do anything for me. Uh, just that I feel like I have a better job and more money than them, and so I'm in a better position than them, and so if anybody should be sacrificing for anybody, I should be sacrificing for them. They shouldn't be sacrificing for me, so I will, like, basically never ask them to do anything for me. Yeah, um, and I guess I'm, this one, like I definitely will, I, I, I mean, there's rare occasion where I have told somebody what to do, but I usually hire people saying, look, I'm never gonna tell you what to do. And then, you know, I usually I try to treat people like colleagues and just have discussions with them and, you know, just treat my postdocs like colleagues rather than as employees and that, uh, and I would say the one exception is, I'd say this person working on plastics and muscles is being sort of code really managed by another postdoc, and that's a, a rare case where somebody was hired to do a specific project. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so the challenges of this is that if you have this many people, you know, I shouldn't have had so many clicks, but you have that many people, it's really hard just to keep up with all of them. And, and so my original idea was, oh, there'll be like subgroups and there'll be clusters of mutual interests. And, and that's really been a, cha a challenge in that, uh, th that a lot, most, many of the projects end up being kind of mostly binary between me and one postdoc. And so just, you know, my, my resource that's in the least supply is my own time. And um, yeah, then the other thing is keeping money coming in to keep these people funded. And that's actually has been relatively easy. It helps to have Bill Gates behind you, which is this. And so Bill Gates has been really nice. You know, this is like one of his, a little quotey from him. And that, uh, you know, so he's uh, been really, you know, the backbone of the financial support of my group for over a decade. And uh, not only that, but I think we've been helpful in influencing some of his thinking and it's just uh, so it's both this relationship has been really good both in terms of having a kind of no strings support but also in uh, uh, being um, you know that I feel like by influencing his thinking I'm having more influence on the world than through other pathways which I influence other people's thinking. So yeah, what are our, our metrics of success? I guess, are we getting high impact papers published in quality journals? Are, are we influencing other people? I guess these are the same for kind of everybody. Um, yeah, are, they, are postdocs in my group able to find good jobs? So I, I think I have at least, I would say something like 80% success or something like that in getting people into tenure track positions and maybe the other 20% mostly find second postdocs. But you know, I think that, um, if you're, you know, I think having postdocs that get jobs, it's really important, uh, both in attracting good people and then also that, you know, those postdocs when they're working, I can see the influence of having been in our group on their work, and so it's another way of kind of extending yourself through the community. 
Uh, and then, you know, I think if it's not fun, I don't want to go to work. And so, uh, you know, I think being fun. And then the other thing is like 10 years later, do people look back and say, oh man, that was really great. That was one of the best times of my life. Or are they regretting? And I, I hope that nobody regretted, ever regretted coming into my group. I don't think anybody has. So you can look at what's going on in my group different ways. But the, I, I, there's basically three pretty disparate areas. And one, and, and a lot of these were accreted over time. So basically, for most of my uh, career, I've been sort of doing geochemical or geophysical modeling, mostly with atmospheric flows, ocean flows, not solid Earth. And then, and also, then some of the ocean modeling stuff evolved into doing ocean-related observations. And then more recently, uh, well, I mean, I've started 20 years ago, but more recently as a growth thing, we're focused on um, more energy and economic modeling and analysis. So one of the sort of uh, things that we've sort of stood up to as an umbrella for a lot of our work is this Carnegie Energy Innovation. And this is more the umbrella for the en energy related work in my group and it's largely yeah, it's largely just a website but um, uh, and but then and, it, and so that's covers uh, most of our sort of energy related research and basically the gates funded work is under this rubric uh, but then there's this other thing that's also with reports to me also largely funded by money that's in the gates universe but so this but this operates quasi-independently within our department. So it's basically two people. And this um, is philanthropically supported mostly. And, um, uh, but it's more focused around bringing scientific knowledge into the California policy process and about uh, scientific communication more and, and, and policy analysis more than sort of direct scientific research. And the way this evolved is originally I hired Mike to try to lead up the energy part of my group. But then, you know, it turns out that people have their own ideas on what to do. And it started veering off in a different direction. So then it became its own thing. And then I had still had the energy side of my group. So, but uh, this is like another thing that exists and, uh, and has been useful. Okay, anyway, research area. So I guess I'm going to talk about ocean stuff first. Um, yeah, and so the, for my PhD dissertation, I studied uh, what happened to the carbon cycle after the end Cretaceous mass extinction event. And a, after that event, um, basically most calcareous or plankton disappeared from the geologic record. Most organisms that, that uh, generated shells or skeletons of calcium carbonate went out of, go, disappear come back some hundreds of thousands of years later. And so my dissertation was about, well, how did the carbon cycle function at that time if, the, if you still had cations coming down the rivers? And what, what was going to allow those cations to be deposited in the sediments if the normal biological pathways don't exist? And, and um, so there was um, some work going on at the same time at the University of Chicago with Jim Walker and so on. And they were looking at controls on shallow water carbonate sedimentation and its relationship in geologic time to carbonate saturation states. And so anyway, basically the main point of my dissertation was that if you killed off the plankton uh, in the open ocean, the minerals, carbonate mineral saturation states would start to rise in the ocean and that would increase the rates of, um, of uh, carbonate deposition in shallow water environments. And that would give a pathway to deposit those cations in the sediments. And there's all these, since that time, there's all of these micrite deposits found in shallow water sediments. Anyway, the main thing that that did is make uh, us understand that carbonate deposition in shallow water environments is very sensitive to changes in ocean chemistry, which led to the whole sort of investigation of ocean acidification and all that as a contemporary issue. And so, you know, soon after um, coming to Carnegie, we did this work, and this was my first postdoc at Carnegie, or maybe my second postdoc, 
And the idea is this is showing carbonate mineral saturation states. This is sort of saturated, undersaturated, and showing that in pre-industrial time, this 280 ppm that, uh, and this is showing the distribution of this 13,000 or so reefs in the world that have been uh, cataloged and shows the distribution of reefs to the underlying, the surrounding uh, mineral saturation state of the open ocean water. And so something like 98% of the corals were surrounded by open ocean waters that were 3.5 times saturated or greater, and all of them three times or greater. And if you march through time, this is you know, probably year 2000 or so, this might be 2030 or so, you know, but you know, by the time, you know, very uh, quick, by the time you get to the CO2 concentrations that are at the, towards the end of the century, you know, basically there's no place left in the ocean with the kind of chemistry that had been supporting coral reefs in, throughout, uh, likely throughout geologic time. And so, you know, the current stressor on corals is temperature, but, um, that they, they seem extremely sensitive to uh, mineral saturation states, and that's changing rapidly in the ocean due to our CO2 emissions. And so, anyway, so we did that kind of work, and, um, you know, but there's a limit to what you could do with coarse resolution ocean models, and kind of that line of research kind of reached uh, some kind of asymptote. And so uh, I decided to start doing some field work. And so um, there's this place in Australia, and it, what's really interesting about this place, so this is, I don't know what, maybe four kilometers across by two kilometers across, and th this um, area almost forms like a bathtub at low tide, and, and so the water here is higher than out there, and then the water flows over the rim at a few low spots, and that makes it geochemically very nice because you... Um, know that any changes in chemical composition in here during those times are due to fluxes, exchanges with the boundary and not due to inflowing water. So anyway, we did a series of experiments there. The first things we did were purely observational, and then we did some of the first ever manipulative experiments where ocean chemistry was manipulated, the biological consequences of those manipulations measured uh, without any kind of artificial confinement or anything. And so basically, we had a system, I don't really have time to go through all this, but where we uh, made a plume of uh, sort of alkaline-rich water and then ran that plume across uh, a, a patch of reef uh, and, and then basically measured uh, properties here and here and then by difference in measuring flow rate, estimate what went into or out of that patch of reef. And so this is, you know, some of our experiment. We use a dye tracer to measure where our plume is going and so on. So anyway, then we brought in a chem lab and all this stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, and so anyway, so we ended up uh, with a nice paper in Nature on this one. And, you know, showing that way, basically when you added the alkalinity that the reef grew faster uh, which is not a big surprise, but it was the first time that it was ever been shown uh, in, in situ. And, you know, we had a nice write-up on the news side on calling it a landmark experiment and all that. We were happy with that. So then, uh, that's, uh, that was our team there. So then we went back a couple of years later um, to do a CO2 addition. So the first one was alkalinity, kind of bringing things back to pre-industrial times. Next one was the idea to bring it to end-of-century conditions. And so this one time we had a drone with us, and so this is our little tank there, a boat putting the plume across, this, the boat for the sampling crew, and that's our sampling crew ready to sample this line as it comes across. And yeah, so basically, you know, you have to say, well, what's, going, what's changes in concentration are due to dilution, and what's the reef, and that's why we add a dye, and we have this whole methods with slopes of dyes to slopes of alkalinity and so on. And I don't, I don't have time to go through all this, but you can, so the control days when we didn't add the CO2, uh, you know, we had measured the change in the saturation state of the water uh, front to back, and then also the calcification rate. And obviously the days we added CO2, the saturation rates went, saturation levels went down and the amount of calcification went down. First time it's ever been demonstrated in situ without sort of chambers and things like that. Yes, anyway, so that's that. That was good.
the, the nature paper. That was good. So, so one of the problems is that we ran, you know, after you do two nature papers down a, a research direction, like what can you do to top that? And we couldn't think of anything to top that. And so uh, like this, we, we went last year and this year on some kind of more disciplinary type work. And I, I've kind of sort of saying like, where do you go with this? Because, uh, and anyway, so, but what we are doing with this right now is this was just from this month, two postdocs, Manu and David, are in Brazil right now. And that there are certain, so we've done some other working tide pools up in, uh, in California, Northern California. And tide pools, because they're out in the sun, there's respiration and so on, the chemical and temperature conditions uh, go all over the place. And in this tide pool in Brazil, there happens to be the brown, there is coral colonies. And so with ideas we're trying to look for, like where are corals growing in extreme environments where you wouldn't expect them to be able to grow? And then, you know, what's allowing them to grow in those conditions? Uh, and that's sort of like where that research theme is headed right now. Okay, I'm thinking I'm going too slowly, so I'm going to pick up the pace. Okay, so then I'm just going to, do, I think, mention three topics of sort of what I'm calling energy-related geophysical modeling. And so basically I, I came out of a long time of sort of climate and geochemical modeling of atmospheres, oceans, et cetera. Um, Again, you know, since people have been running climate models for 50 years now, the question is, well, what can you do with it that's new and different and somebody cares about it and it's important? And this is always our challenge, you know, that there's plenty to do, but, like, what do you do that somebody will actually care about? And so we actually care whether people care about it. I mean, sometimes we do things just for fun, but mostly we want to do things that people will find useful. So, um, yeah, so one of the kinds of studies we did was looking at um, this sort of, um, so if you have a uh, wind turbine, you know, wind turbine gets more or less half the kinetic energy that passes through it, which is a kind of amazing because you think of these little thin blades, but they're somehow capturing half the energy that's flowing through that disk. And, but, you know, if that means if you have three wind turbines, the first one takes half, the second one takes another half, you're down to a quarter, you're down to one eighth. So very quickly, if you have a regional scale wind farm, the, the kinetic energy momentum has to be transported vertically and not horizontally to get the energy to the farm. And so the question is, what are the controls on downward transport of momentum and kinetic energy in the, through the troposphere to the boundary layer? And so this paper was in PNAS, uh, maybe two years, I guess it was 2018, I'm not sure. The, um, and this one is the surface heat flux. This is three latitude bands, but this is surface heat flux. This is heat coming, blue is ocean, green is land. And basically where heat is coming out of the ocean, the atmosphere is able to transport much more kinetic energy downward. So the question was, that motivated this is it windier over the ocean just because there's no drag and the ocean's smooth. And maybe if you put a bunch of wind turbines out there that it's going to be no better than land. Or maybe there's something about the oceans that actually allows the atmosphere to transport more uh, heat, more momentum and kinetic energy downward. A and so we found in this one um, that basically the that downward transport of momentum and kinetic energy to the surface is much enhanced in areas where there's a high heat flux from the surface. And you know, now there's, now this paper just sort of waved arms about why. And so I have a postdoc now who's trying to work on this more dynamically and that there's two kinds of uh, main uh, theories. And that one is that the uh, ocean heat transport sets up high temperature gradients in the surface, which then uh, leads to some wave breaking in the atmosphere. And the other view is that the high heat fluxes uh, generate atmospheric instabilities that through convective processes bring down kinetic energy. And so there's a postdoc now who's following up on this. But that, that's kind of like one example of energy related geophysical modeling. So this one's less, a little bit less energy, but we had this in uh, Nature now two years ago. And this was analyzing model results of other people uh, building relationships between 
uh, observables in the model for the now and its future projections, and then looking at which of the observables were most closely aligned with data today. And basically, we found that the models that sort of did the best at reproducing today's top of atmosphere energy budgets were the models that had the higher climate sensitivities and that, that sort of provided evidence that the lower climate sensitivity models were probably less reliable. Or, and the new generation of models is, are coming out with higher climate sensitivities, so it seems good. So that's another thing. So then this one is actually uh, one, Gita's uh, postdoc, she got a, she's got a job at UT Austin and she'll be starting in a few months. But, um, and this is actually a major research direction now in my group in that this, this is uh, something that was published last year, Nature Communications. And so there's two, basically, in, this, this, in these cases, the same aerosol sulfate mostly, but also black carbon and so on are being emitted. And she basically, we, mostly she did it in different regions. And so this was, um, in this case, the, the emissions are coming from China, in this case from India. And you know when you say, well, the global cooling here was from China, this was a China scale emissions. So, the, so basically this would say, well, at least in this model, China's emissions causes around you know, 0.2 degrees global cooling. And this is the spatial pattern that you'd expect to be from. But the, spa you know, but the cooling that you get from emitting the same emissions in India uh, seems to be something like 10% and with a very different spatial pattern. And it turns out some of it is, has to do with the aerosols getting rained out, but also even if you go look at the radiative forcing and the, the climate, you know, that, that it is um, much less sensitivity to the radiative forcing. And so this is leading us down this road of trying to understand global and regional consequences of regional radiative forcing or regional changes. And so the, this, um, I could go through there's all kinds of things that we do, like change in land use, change irrigation, uh, et cetera, that um, regionally affect the planet, but then have global implications. So that's like one of our research directions. OK, so then the last sort of area going on in my group is this energy and economic modeling and analysis. And um, yeah, so that one, so Steve Davis was a former postdoc who um, is now at um, UC Irvine. And so basically, uh, we, yeah, so one of the nice things of, basically we ran this meeting uh, uh, saying, well, what's the hardest parts of our economy to decarbonize? And, uh, and then how would we think about getting carbon, em carbon emissions out of those parts of the economy? And, um, Anyway, this was, um, uh, you know, and so anyway, involved, you know, so Chris Field is in here, former Carnegie person. The, um, anyway, so this was, and so now what we're doing, so this was just like a review kind of analysis one, but now what we're trying to do is model this system, and basically what we have now is mostly just the most of the green. So the green parts of this is electricity. The red is CO2. This is hydrogen. And then the purple is, she, is hydrocarbons, liquid hydrocarbons. And so right now we're pretty much mostly with the electricity, most of this green with a little bit of the hydrogen. But we're sort of building up to something like this. And yeah, so this is sort of a wiring diagram of what we're building up to. But basically the orange parts of this is what we have now. So the first paper that came out of this work was um, by Matt Shainer. And Matt was a postdoc who came out of Caltech working with Nate Lewis. And you know, the basic, yeah, so one of the things was that National Renewable Energy Lab and also um, uh, NOAA came out with papers saying that we could decarbonize about 80% of our energy system uh, at relatively low cost if we had backup generation. And, but both the models that were used for both of those were proprietary black boxes, so you just had to trust, um, you know, sort of trust the authors that they were, they were good, but there was no any way you can independently. So we said, well, can we kind of get at this from a more geophysical perspective and try to uh, explain why it's hard to go beyond 80% on, on these. 
in a way that, um, you know, where all the code and things could be in the supporting material and there was nothing uh, hidden. And so basically, if you look at this, this is the over a 36 year period, uh, you know, the median and the, um, uh, you know, showing the variability on, on daily averages for wind and solar. And, you know, obviously the wind is super variable, solar is variable, and also there's, uh, there was only one year of demand data, but demand is also variable. And so the challenge is how do you match all these things up in a renewable based system? And I don't have time to go through this, but we looked at different amounts of storage. And basically, what's the fraction of demand that you're meeting by solar and wind and storage versus other generators or just not meeting demand? And basically, you can see in these simulations, which are just basically taking linear combinations of these things plus adding storage, that um, you know, it's pretty linear up to something like 80%. And then it starts uh, getting really steep after that. And so that, you know, that right away suggests the reasons why the other uh, papers got uh, those kind of results. And so if you take these same sort of results and put them on a log scale, you can kind of see that like if you had just like a pure solar system, you'd have to 10 times overbuild your installed capacity to get enough, even with four days worth of storage. And right now the world has a couple of hours of storage maybe. So you, this is like impossible economically today. And the same thing if you went all wind, you'd still need around 10 times the wind capacity and probably like at least two weeks worth of storage. And, you know, but, uh, and basically you could, if you had a couple of days of storage, do with like a five times overbuild. But the main point is that you get a linear response up to around 80%. And then after that, you really start to need lots and lots of overbuild to get, uh, Thing, you know, to get reliability. And so basically, it showed in a sort of simple way why the more complicated models were getting the answers they were getting. And so since that time, so this was sort of like where that was. And so since that time, we've added an optimization overlay and then added more and more technologies to this thing. Uh, yeah, so that's, anyway, so we're going towards there. And, uh, and we've, like have a bunch of papers submitted that are looking at particular issues. Like, you know, there's people who say nuclear power is good for renewables because you have backup when the wind and solar isn't going. And other people are saying nuclear power competes with renewables. So we looked at that issue and we basically uh, showed that really this, that increased penetration of nuclear hurts renewables, doesn't help renewables. There's also another paper submitted on value of storage as a function of price. Another paper on the feasibility of power to gas to power. So looking at different pathways. And this one, in this project, I'm working closely with, uh, most closely with Nate Lewis from Caltech and also with Steve Davis from uh, UC Irvine, who's a former postdoc. Okay, I think we went there. Yeah, so this is the kind of example of some, this is a paper from Dave uh, Farnham. It's a sort of, uh, but the kind of thing where we've taken this kind of model, this, this, you know, this kind of model and then run, I guess in this case, 30,000 things varying parameters all over the space, place and then saying, oh, do the energy systems, the optimal energy systems fall into different families. And so like, here's like a natural gas CCS you know, basically did a cluster analysis on this sort of Monte Carlo type analysis. analysis. And so like this one cluster where natural gas with ca carbon capture and storage is winning. Another sort of family where nuclear wins. And then there's this family over here that's largely wind dominated but with a lot of natural gas backup. There's this one over here that's solar dominated and the solar dominated ones have a lot of storage in it. And then there's another one that's kind of a blended uh, a blended thing. But the idea is that instead of, most people, modelers in this world kind of do like a couple of scenarios and they have some vision of the future that they're promoting. And so we're sort of saying like, why not we come up with a uh, hundred thousand or a million visions of the future and then think what would have to be true to go down these different pathways. And the idea, then against all of these backgrounds, you can compute the partial derivatives of system costs relative to the different parameters and say, well, under what 
set of circumstances with different kinds of innovations be able to play in future markets and all of this kind of stuff. So, so like Matt was, um, who did the other work, he, the, basically he had multiple like venture capital people trying to hire him and the other person who has been working on this got hired by some energy and environment consulting company so that this, this kind of work it's kind of unusual because there's a lot of um, sort of uh, both sort of investor and environmental consultant pathway out of this one where most of the other work I've been doing has been just having academia as the, as the sort of career path. So anyway, that's, um, let me, see. yeah, so that, yeah, I guess that's basically it. And so let, let me just actually come back, just to come back to where I started because that's, it's really the, you know, the, the people in my group, oops. Yeah, so, you know, that it's, um, you know, so I have a super diverse group. We're super opportunistic and I'm afforded that because we have the Carnegie Endowment support, which doesn't have specific deliverables tied to it, have the Gates funding that doesn't have specific deliverables tied to it. I have a really great group right now and you know it's like a pleasure for me to go into the office and work with these people and, and, and um, you know we're, we're into small science it's like what can a project be that's led by a postdoc and then I can have other people helping the postdoc but I'm a big believer in small science that that I you know that the um, you know it's give, div, giving as much responsibility and authority as far down the corporate hierarchy as possible. And, um, and it's just been a lot of fun. And it would be nice if our institution would continue to allow us to do our work. <laughs> and with that, I'll close. Questions for Ken? I see one in the back. Well, yeah, thank you. That was a very impressive summary about uh, your group and its work. Yeah, so first of all, I say that we are, you know, we were a five person department, um, you know, a few years ago. And since then, Chris Field left for Stanford, Greg Asner left for Arizona. And Joe is about to retire, and the institution has not allowed us to do any hires of permanent type people. And so, you know, so really for the long term, we're down to Anna and me. And, you know, depending on how things go, that could be long, long term could mean different things. Um, but Anna does a few different things. I would say, and I'm not going to do well to represent her work, but she, first of all, she was like one of the co-authors um, of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Scientific, you know, Science Plan, and so she's heavily integrated into the sci the um, carbon cycle community that's working in sort of the surficial exchangeable reservoirs of land, ocean, atmosphere. That. Um, she, there, I would think, at least the way I'm conceiving of her work, and I'm sure I'm misrepresenting it, that the, one of the things that she does is inverse modeling of the atmosphere. And so let's say you have something like a, a satellite and ground stations that are measuring CO2 concentrations. You know, that's like an advection diffusion type equation. And, this notorious difficulty of solving advection diffusion equations for surface boundary conditions, but that's what you try to do. And so because that's not a well-formed problem, you have to put some constraints on the surface fields. And so in a Bayesian context, you have different priors, and those priors could either be model predictions or they could be different kind of data sets. And, and so she's, anyway, she's involved in that world of um, trying to infer surface sources and sinks from atmospheric observations and then understanding uh, what kind of priors and how the choice of priors influence those results. And then she has another 
research effort that has some overlap, but having to do with water quality and groundwater, but also lake uh, eutrophication and so on. So the Great Lakes, there are these harmful algal blooms that are due to nutrient runoff. And I think the start of the, I think the connection was she's done some work doing inverse modeling. You know, sometimes people find some pollutants in the groundwater and you have a bunch of wells that are polluted and then you have to try to do an inverse thing to figure out what the source of that pollution was. And so I think the connection between the two research areas was inverse modeling, but I think she does a lot of stuff on the pollution, the water quality side that's forward modeling and relating it to d different drivers. So, but as far as I understand her work, it's mostly uh, either atmospheric inversions or more like regional scale water quality, sort of at the scale of the Great Lakes. Now, Joe Berry, Joe is really great, by the way, and, uh, and Joe is, uh, so he has this, I might miss, be, I'm sure I'm misrepresenting everybody, I'm misrepresenting Joe, he has this idea that he only has two good weeks a year. And, and so at one point, I don't know if it's true of the first, are you familiar with the, are you familiar with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? They produce all these reports and things. At least on one cycle, Joe was the most cited person of everybody cited in that entire IPCC report. Because he was on some really fundamental papers having, so basically Joe, you know, plants have stomates, which are like little pores that allow plants to get in CO2, and they basically, that they open themselves, they're trying to solve an optimization problem, they're trying to reduce water loss but increase CO2 uptake. And Joe was like part of the first group that understood what a plant stomate did, and then they modeled that, and they modeled it with isotopically, and so like Joe was involved in really foundational work in understanding how leaves work. And so, you know, those foundational papers are like cited a zillion times. But then since then, he's been doing things like um, looking at, there's like COS, carbonyl sulfide, I think it is. That, so that, that um, one of the problems with CO2 is it exchanges both ways in a plant leaf. Whereas carbonyl sulfide, uh, the plant takes it up thinking it's CO2, but then doesn't release it. So now you have a way of getting at the gross flux if you just look at CO2 to carbonyl sulfide fluxes. And so he did that. I'm just thinking of the things he worked on the last decade. Then the, the other one was that um, when plants photosynthesize, there's some point at which some electron changes some shell and it fluoresces. And it fluoresces in a wavelength that there's something in the solar corona that absorbs uh, at that wavelength. And so the atmosphere is not polluted by sunlight at that wavelength. And so you can observe from satellites. And also the atmosphere is transparent, so you can observe this sort of fluorescence line uh, from satellites. And, and that's very directly related to gro gross photosynthesis. And, uh, and so, yeah, so I think both with the carbonyl sulfide and with fluorescence that Joe has been focused on can we, through remote sensing or these other sort of big data approaches, understand um, the bidirectional fluxes occurring at leaf surfaces? Um, and so, and, and really that's pretty much, and so we're really disparate department and that, but we like each other and hang out. No, no, but I'm saying that this, no, because always we get all this stuff from like that there's something wrong that we're not actually writing papers and collaborating together. And we think like we're not, not all of us have plenty of collaborators and all we really want from our colleagues is like we want to be appreciated. We want them to be nice to us. We want them to, to have nice conversations and be intellectually stimulated by them. But we don't need them for collaboration, you know, and so and and so we think it's good that we're diverse and all working on different things because that's stimulating. But uh, for some reason, we're an organization that thinks we should be actually writing papers together, which we see no reason why we need to be doing that. Okay. Uh, getting back to your research, um, 
I'm very, since I know almost nothing about global climate modeling and all this stuff, I'm, I'm curious about how you actually get to some of these uh, slides you showed. Like, so for example, you showed this result of, you have aerosol emitting from China and India and they have a different effect on the global climate. Um, how do you, what is the research in that paper? Is this a model where you just have a, some standard global model? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah so I would say that, um, you know, having done research both in observational stuff, saying what is the oceanographic stuff and the modeling stuff, that um, that my sense is that it's much easier to get a high profile paper with the modeling stuff, and that you know the, the models we're using are developed by National Center for Atmospheric okay. Research. That um, that you know so. You know, the dumbest kind of modeling paper is we took some model off the shelf. We did X and Y, and here's what happens when you do X versus Y, and we have no idea why. Please publish. Right? right? Sure. Okay. And, and then, you know, there's different degrees of mechanistic understanding that... Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm getting at more specific question for that, say, for that particular paper. I mean... When, you, when you're talking about aerosol emissions from China versus India. So, okay, so you're taking yeah. some model of global yeah, yeah. So, let me so just are you taking actual emissions of aerosols from those and pumping them in, or? No, well, we took what's estimated for aerosol okay. emissions from China, taking a model off the shelf. So where I was, where I was starting leading to is that the, um, the zero, you know, for the zeroth order thing, I'm trying not to be too honest here, the, uh, no, but the zeroth order thing is take a model off the shelf, do X and Y, we publish this, we have no idea why it happens, right? <laughs> now, the, now let me be a little less, more generous towards ourselves. That, that, you know, we did have some, we, first of all, there were other simulations and supporting material with other model configurations with another model, that there's some uh, analysis of what, factors could be causing these differences and things like this. But, you know, if, you, if, if I was to simplify it, it's basically an idiot. Uh, we took the model off the shelf and ran things and then waved our arms, you know. And so, and, but, you know, now we're sort of this postdocs who are like doing other effects, you know, similar related work where we're trying to get at a more mechanistic understanding. But, um, you know, yeah, un understanding is hard, let's just say that. But yeah, I would say it's, I'm always unsatisfied with the degree of mechanistic understanding in all our papers. Um, so this is another question about your research, but maybe more on the logistical side. Um, it's clear that your relationship with the Gates Foundation has enabled fantastic it's not things. Not Gates Foundation, it's him himself. Bill he, Gates. Okay. We're enemies of the foundation. I'm corrected. Um, your relationship with Bill Gates has allowed you to do amazing things, and I think all of us staff scientists here would, would love to have that sort of relationship. <laughs> so I'm wondering, not necessarily with Gates, but similar. I, I guess I'm, I, I would like to know about the development of that. How did that come about? Was it facilitated by the institution? Personal connections? Can you just give us a little bit of the early history? Yeah, I mean, I was, I got a phone call saying uh, Gates, uh, somebody recommended me basically out in the world and they contacted me and then, but the other thing, you know, so for the first year, I've, um, you know, I was just helpful in organizing things. And until this day, I'm, I've never asked them for anything. And so, and I always try to be helpful. And, and I think the key is just try to do useful stuff. That, that, you know, I think if you try to be helpful and you try to do work that's useful to people, that, so, uh, you know, I'm all for curiosity-driven science, and a lot of our papers are just curiosity-driven, but a lot of them are like, what would people actually find useful? And, and I think that um, the other thing is just trying to help. So I'm a big believer in, 
you know, like you get back what you put out, kind of, and that if in interactions you just try to be helpful, then eventually people will help you. It might not be the same person, but you kind of get back what you put out. And that, um, and so I think with Gates stuff, I think just that they saw I was really trying to help. Like he says, I want to learn about something, and I would go, okay. And I don't ask for anything. I just say, how can I help you learn about that? And, and then also, I, I'm always ready to be the complete idiot in the room. Like, no, I'm like a f more than happy to exhibit my ignorance about anything. And, and I, don't also don't, I also don't believe, I believe like almost all of my beliefs could be false. And, and, and so, you know, so I think when you have somebody, look, I want to help. I think this, but I could be wrong. Um, you know, there's nothing I'm trying to sell here. Let's see what the reality is. And I think just when you, people feel like, oh, so I think for him, I think he's felt like, well, I'm not trying to sell him anything. I'm not trying to get anything from him. I'm trying to actually help. And, and and so I think it's you know I've been lucky, but I think just taking that attitude of what can I do that's both useful and helpful, and you know and that's like the same thing with my postdocs. I just try to be helpful to them and think that I can ride on their coattails when they're successful. So. So speaking of Bill Gates, I learned from this new three-part documentary series. I still have to watch it. That he's a big proponent of. Uh, Next generation nuclear reactors uh, using depleted uranium. Yep. Um, and, I, and I guess you submitted a paper in your talk. You're doing some new modeling analysis uh -huh. with nuclear, and you mentioned that in all scenarios, renewables lose against uh, nuclear power. No, I didn't say that. I said that in scenario, the question was so the, the typically pro renewable people tend to be anti nuclear. That, that's right. Whereas the pro-nuclear people say, oh, well, nu renewables need nuclear because sometimes the wind's not sh blowing. And so actually nuclear kind of helps renewables. And what we've found is that that second thing is just not right, that there's no scenario in which increased pen penetration of, of nuclear actually helps renewables. That in every, so if you build more nu nuclear in a cost-optimal effect system, you want to build less renewables, is what we're finding. Okay. So, but not that it could compete, because today, right now, nuclear costs twice as much, and it's not going to compete. So. so a follow on from that, though, is do your calculations about storage deal with the issues of rare metals? So there's only no, not yet. in the world. And, uh, right now, we're just doing that as costs. And the, I mean, this is a big question of how much innovation could help switch to other metals and so on. Any other questions? If not, Ken's around the afternoon. His schedule's full, so about the only time you have a chance to talk with him is over lunch. So please, please take advantage of that if you want to. Uh, but let's thank Ken for the, uh, the very nice lecture. Yeah, I, I have to say that within our department right now, you know, like we've been going through a sort of troubled time over the last couple of years. But like within our department now, it's socially great. Like it's actually brought us all together, and we're, you know, we're actually very good mood socially within our department, and it's just the dealing with the sort of when you go above our department. <laughs>